uh, lecture in, in our series, in the lovely series on computability. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to have with us uh, um, today uh, Dr. Rydia Perlman. Um, Dr. Perlman uh, completed her PhD in MIT. Um, but as we just uh, discussed, even before completing uh, the thesis, uh, was a developer uh, and actually of, of, of a child-friendly version of, of Logo, which is something you can mention. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's well. just and been mentioned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> under, and she's done that un under Simon, uh, Seymour Papert. Um, and then she went on to, made, uh, to make uh, large contributions uh, to various areas of network uh, design, uh, many of which underlie the magnificent uh, thing that we use uh, uh, every day. So the most uh, well-known is, is the STP protocol, but there are many others that uh, help the internet to be either reliable and, and, and scalable. Uh, thing that that we um, that we know. Um, so Dr. Perlman holds uh, more than 100 patents, which is quite a lot, and, and she's been inducted to the Internet Hall of Fame at uh, 2013. And she's currently employed uh, by the EMC uh, Corporation. And the, t the provocative title of her talk today is how to build an insecure system out of perfectly good cryptography. So thank you very much. Okay. So um, feel free to ask questions and, and so forth, especially if I'm uh, kind of using terms that you're not familiar with because I'm, you know, I was, yeah, if, yeah, I can easily explain anything. So anyway, um, what I like to do is get the world to kind of focus on areas that I think are kind of neglected in terms of research. So um, in this case, uh, there's a lot of cryptographers and it's wonderful that we have them, but there's a lot more to security than just getting the crypto right. So um, I'll, I'll give examples like that. So um, yeah, and I'll show a variety of different kinds of system issues that have been deployed, that were standardized, that were, you know, whatever, that um, even though that basic crypto was fine, um, you know, they didn't work. So one thing is proofs. It's hard to get any sort of security papers uh, published without some sort of proof, um, a formal proof of security. But these, these proofs tend to kind of focus on just the math of that rather than the system design. Um, and if something comes with a proof of security, you'll feel safe using it even if uh, you don't understand the proof. And um, even, you know, sometimes the proof assumes properties that there's no particular reason why they should be true and proves, assuming those properties, assumes um, uh, properties that you don't necessarily need. But it, it's a proof, so people get excited about it. So I will um, give, yeah, proofs are neither necessary nor sufficient. Sometimes they're yet another way of, um, you know, finding bugs, but you can't just rely on them. So I'll give an example. It's a nice, simple example of um, um, a system that you can build out of provably secure cryptography. So the one cryptographic algorithm that's sort of provably secure is you take your message and exclusive or it with a random number that's as big as the message and no amount of compute power can distinguish any message from any other message. So to review what XOR is, um, if you exclusive or something with something twice, they cancel each other out and you can do it in any order. So, um, you know, B, let's see, uh, do I, yeah, B exclusive or with A, you know, all this kind of thing. The B's cancel out, the C's cancel out, and you'll get A. So let's use this in order to build a um, insecure system. So Alice wants to send Bob a message, but they don't have a shared secret. If they had a shared secret, she could encrypt it and he could decrypt it with the secret. Um, so the physical 
analogy, the physical mail analogy, is Alice wants to send something to Bob that nobody in the post office can look at when it's um, in between. So she puts on a big lock on the box and mails it to Bob. Bob has no key to her lock, so he can't read it, but he can add an extra lock on it. And so he sends that back. The box is now protected with two locks. And then Alice can remove her lock. Um, um, when it, she receives it, she removes her lock, and now it's protected with Bob's lock, and he does have a key. So, um, you know, it's been protected the whole time. And um, we could do the same thing with crypto. By Alice and Bob each choose a random number, which is as big as the message. Alice puts her lock on the message by exclusive wearing it with her number. Bob adds his lock by exclusive wearing it with um, his number. And she can get rid of her lock by exclusive wearing with her number. And then now it's protected with Bob's thing. And then he can read the message, which is like way cool, except it's not secure. Um, and the reason it's not secure is if you, um, if you take these three messages, the blue, the yellow, and the green, and exclusive wear them all together, you'll get the message. So another proof story is one of the things, one of my earliest papers was showing how a particular network's algorithm um, would become completely unstable if you injected uh, three messages into the system. And, you know, like with your PC, if it, um, it gets uh, in a bad state, you know to power it off. With a network, there's no on-off button, so it's kind of really bad if it gets into that state. So um, um, I you know, said, gee, it's not good for a network to get into the state, and here is how to design the algorithm so it would be robust. And uh, amazingly, a few years after the paper got published, the ARPANET actually did get into that state, um, which I had nothing to do with. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and then it was like a real, um, a real trick to get the ARPANET working because, um, again, there's no on-off button. So, um, you know, that was an amazing story. But, um, you know, uh, at some point after all of this, somebody said to me that he had this wonderful system for proving protocols were correct. And these papers, there were a whole bunch of them. They, they always kind of put me to sleep. Um, but I was being polite, and I said, OK, well, you know, have you proven anything, um, you know, anything real correct with it? And he said, yes, I proved that the ARPANET thing was correct. And I said, but it's not correct. And he said, it is. I proved it was correct. And I said, but if you inject three well-chosen messages into the system, the network is down forever. And he said, well, if you put in bad input, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> and if a network is so fragile that merely by, you know, and in this case, it wasn't malicious. There was a, a, a router that just wasn't feeling good one day. And in its dying gasp, it started issuing messages with random um, information in it, which just happened to get the three messages. And he, you know, sort of said, I curse you, a world, take this. And the network was down forever. So, um, um, so, yeah, we worried about that. Yeah, how about um, the injected message? It's a, what? It's a message. It's a conditioning system. Uh, yes, yes, right, it's the right. the first message. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It, it's, it's sort of white noise, I guess. <laughs> so, okay. So the next thing is standards. So this is something that I just like to rant about. Um, things are so confusing. Um, in, in the field, there's always lots of different technologies that sound so similar. And I always like to get to the heart of what is really different about A and B and how do they compare. Nobody else seems to do it. So they dive right into the details of A or dive right into the details of B. Um, so if I try to understand them, I have to look at the two specs. And they're two huge specs, all with their own jargon for no good reason. And then if I ask someone who's an expert at A, how does it compare with B, they say, oh, A is awesome and B sucks. And then I ask a B person, I get the opposite answer. And then if I find out things about B that are actually better, I tell the A people, actually, it has these features, and it works better in this case for whatever. 
no problem, the A people steal the ideas. And so both the A spec and the B spec are moving targets because no one cares what's inside, they just kind of want to get credit. Um, and so it's natural to think of standards bodies as sort of well-educated technologists that are carefully weighing engineering trade-offs. But a much more accurate way to think of them is as drunken sports fans. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but having said that, when I get so frustrated at the world for unnecessarily reinventing things, I'm going to give an example where a standards body adopted something from another standards body without trying to reinvent it, which ordinarily I would applaud them for, but in this case it was bad and I'll explain why. So um, public keys, just a quick review. Um, a, a public key is sort of a pair of numbers that are inverses of each other, a public key and a private key and you tell everyone your pri uh, public key and you keep your private key. If I want to encrypt a message for you, I use your public key, you reverse it, you undo that with your private key. You can also sign something with your private key and I can verify the signature is co correct with your public key. And so we can do all this cool stuff so long as I reliably know your public key. Um, so how does Bob know Alice's public key? Well, there's this concept of a certificate where somebody that um, Bob trusts signs a message saying, I vouch for the fact that this is Alice's public key. So as long as Bob knows this, oh, and it's the thing that signs is called the CA for Certification Authority. So now back to the lecture. So I'm talking about a standards body adopting a certificate format done by a different sports team, so to speak. Um, so this particular, um, what is a certificate? It says, this name goes with this public key, and it's signed. Yeah. What could go wrong? So IETF, which is sports team A, uh, decided to base their certificates on this other standard called X509, which was done by ITU. It's, yeah, don't worry about all these acronyms, two different uh, bodies. Why should it matter? Well, the problem with X509 is that it maps an X500 name to a public key. Now, what's an X500 name? It's a lovely namespace. Um, it's a lovely hierarchical namespace where, just like DNS, which um, has periods between the components, this one is kind of like that. There's components, but also you say what type of component it is. So a component might be C equals would be a country, O equals is an organization, OU is an organization unit, whatever that is, and CN is a common name. So you have these things and you can build a hierarchical name out of that. So X509 would have been fine if internet protocols and internet users were using X509 names, but they don't. They use DNS names. It's, neither one is better, but something that maps a name you're not using to a key is, is not very useful. So what good is something that maps a string that the application is not aware of to a key? So the human types foo.com, or it's a DNS name in a URL, and the site sends a certificate with an X500 name. So let's say that the name in the certificate is C equals US, O equals Attica prison, OU equals death row, OU equals particularly vile prisoners, and CN equals horrible person. So one strategy that was used by some implementations is to say, there's no way to map the DNS name to whatever string is there, so I'll ignore it. So they did all the careful verification of the math, but ignored the name. In which case, what security are you getting? Um, only the warm, fuzzy feeling that somebody paid somebody for a certificate. But if, uh, the whole concept of certificate to me has been by now just debased because there was an idea of security certificate, which is a slightly different notion. And we all have been now trained to say, ignore it, give me an exception, because you know the, the, the servers are issued in bad certificates, and if you really stop any anytime you see a bad certificate, you will get nothing done. So all of us are now click, 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 you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Ignore, ignore, ignore. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that, that's a great point. And um, yeah, I could, I could rant about that a little bit 
too. But um, y yeah, um, there are so many reasons why you get all these exceptions for certificates. Most of them just fine, like for instance that it's expired because you know the organization doesn't want to pay the exorbitant fee for renewing it and, and whatever. Um, so yeah, as long as people get trained to just ignore all of, oh right, the more random things that pop up and ask you um, these obscure questions and you say, sure, and nothing bad happens. <laughs> you nothing know, that, bad that you see me. Well, you don't know till later, though. <laughs> right, right. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that too, as um, you know, right. I don't think humans should be being asked questions like that. So, um, what do you do about this fact that it's an X500 name and a DNS name? Well, they've come up with at least three different ways of cramming a DNS name into an X500 name. One is that they put an extra field in the certificate for alternate name. You could put it there. Another one is you could use the bottom of the X500 name called the common name and put it there. Or you can convert it, a, an X500 name, into a DNS name by, t uh, instead of C equals, uh, coming up with something called, uh, you know, a new type of thing called DC, domain component. So Amazon.com would be uh, DC equals com, DC equals whatever. Now, is three ways better than one? No, <laughs> because suppose you go to SCA that, makes, that believes your DNS name has to be in the alternate name and doesn't care what you put into the common name then you could get a certificate that a verifier might only look at the common name and you could claim to be whatever you want to be. So, um, and that, that's a security problem waiting to happen. Now human names are another difficult problem. So I'd love humans to be authenticated with certificates and keys, but what do we do for names? Um, now if all parents were as creative as mine, there wouldn't be a problem. I believe I am the only Radia Perlman on Earth. But if you go to any big company, there's a million John Smiths. So you want to send them email, and in the directory, there's six of them. So, well, th there's a John Smith, and then they hire somebody else, and they say, okay, you have to use middle initial, John.Q.Smith, and uh, someone else is Johnny Smith, and whatever. How are you supposed to tell the difference? Now, I would solve this problem by if I were a hiring manager at a company, you know, I'd be interviewing someone and I'd say, wow, your resume is spectacular, we need someone just like you, but we already have a John Smith, so we can't hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and then parents would learn to be more creative. But, um, <laughs> you know, so, so this naming thing is a real problem. But even if you solve the names somehow, um, it doesn't, tell us who we can trust. So imposters have <coughs> um, managed to um, impersonate airline pilots and doctors just by dressing the part. Sometimes they even have impeccable credentials like Bernie Madoff. Um, and we don't tend to search for things with DNS names anyway. So this is like a great concept, but uh, um, you know, to make it real, there's a lot more stuff to think about. Okay, oh yeah, like for instance, you frantically search on the net for rat poison antidote because your kid has just um, swallowed some and you get an answer on the internet. How do you know that's true? You know, you're not doing it based on DNS name or anything like that. You just search and whatever you get, you tend to believe. So that's another kind of interesting security problem I think people haven't thought about, which is once you um, just, flood the internet with wrong stuff, how will anybody kind of know what is actually true anymore? Okay, so summary so far, I'll, I'll do little summaries periodically. Uh, a proof does not mean that things are secure, and names and who you should trust is a tricky issue. So, a new topic. Um, ah, so this was this is kind of subtle, but I thought it was kind of cool. When we were doing the first edition of our um, network security book, um, I'm co-author on a network security book, um, we were documenting various things. And so one of them was a, a standard for doing uh, secure electronic mail. So you could sign messages, you could encrypt messages. 
and it was it had been there and lots of you know reputable people thought it was fine and it was completely insecure um, and the reason it was insecure is that there was a crypto, a crypto algorithm that was being used that was known secure because it was secure in banking but it wasn't secure for email. So how can you have a cryptographic algorithm that's secure for banking, which involves money and all this, completely insecure for email? So, um, um, so this was a standard. Um, they were using as a cryptographic integrity check um, something that um, is called a CBC residue. I'll explain what it is in a minute, scary name. Um, and what is it? It's a cryptographic integrity check based on secret keys. So you take the message and a secret key and you run them through a function and you get a checksum that if you don't know the secret, you can't compute the checksum or verify it. And that's known as CBC residue. And that's what banks were using. So how were banks using this um, function? Well, bank A and bank B would share a secret, S, and when a, bank A wants to send a message to bank B, they compute the residue, and um, so if R1 is the residue of the message and S, you send the message and the residue, and so it can verify it, and likewise this guy can also compute a residue, and so that's what it was using. And this is completely secure, still is very secure, um, and was at the time known to be secure because someone would have broken it um, if it wasn't secure. So meanwhile, they were um, inventing uh, this standard for, pre yes? That seems like verification, like authentication, not the encryption. It's not, it's not encryption, it is only verification that the message is correct. Yes, you are right. I mean, you, you could also encrypt the message, but um, uh, you might want to, in fact. But. Right. The banks actually didn't, um, you know, because this stuff was not particularly secret. It was just they wanted it to be correct. Yeah. Um, and for email, sometimes you might want to encrypt it, and sometimes you might only want to integrity protect it. And there were like n different variations of this, all of them insecure. So I'm only going to talk about one of them, um, which is where um, Alice sends Bob a message and. Um, I think it's not encrypted, but um, it only integrity checked. So um, this standard had two ways of doing an integrity check. One was with um, a message digest, also known as a cryptographic hash, um, and the other one was CBC residue. Now they didn't just want to use the first one because that was a newly invented function at the time, and so they. Um, um, you know, who knows whether it would really work out, but they also had the ability to use this tried and true known secure function of CBC residue. So what's a message digest? Well, first they kind of invented public key cryptography and realized that it was just ridiculously slow. So if you wanted to digitally sign a huge message, it just would be kind of impractical to have to go through the whole thing with the public key. So instead, they came up with this concept of a, a message digest, where you take the huge message, you run it through a function which gives you a fixed set of bits, like a 128-bit number, and that's what you sign, the 128-bit number. Um, so when you're signing something with a public key, you're actually signing all messages that have the same digest. Now, a digest is 128 bits, or uh, the newer ones are 256 bits, but let, let's say 128 bits. How many messages are there? Um, how many digests are there? Two to the 128. How many messages of varying lengths are there that have that digest? Zillions and zillions. <laughs> so um, it's kind of would be really sad if you signed a message. Ten to the thirty. It's a very large number. Yes, yes, that's the thing. It is a very large number. So, um, but the thing that's sort of a little scary is that if I send you a message um, that says I I owe you five dollars, and you can find some other message that says um, um, I heretofore decree that you know. Uh, Radia owes me, and whatever the number is that makes the hash come out right, you know, 97 zillion to, you know, whatever. And if those two had the same hash, 
I've signed the other one. Yeah, but usually these hash functions are designed in a way that it's very hard to, to find collisions. So exactly. Yes, in principle, you could, but it's going to be very difficult in part. Right. So, yes, so that is the um, important thing, that this function, it has to be infeasible to find two messages with the same uh, digest. And you could, the only way you can do it if it's cryptographically good is by brute force search and the probability of finding two things with these enormous numbers um, is, is just sufficiently small that people feel um, okay about signing a message digest. And if somebody just happened to stumble across two messages that had the same digest, the mathematicians would declare that digest function broken. So it just sort of never happens. So um, it's important to understand that property when I describe why CBC residue didn't work and, um, and message digest would have. So what is CBC residue? You do encryption, like when, when you have a message that's bigger than the block that you encrypt, you have to kind of chain it together in <coughs> some way. So C, uh, 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 cipher block chaining is, is CBC. And CBC residue is you encrypt the message um, with some sort of key in this particular mode of chaining it together, and you throw everything away except the last block. So you take the message, you uh, you uh, ignore that for the moment, you encrypt it with the key, you have the first ciphertext block, and then you're going to exclusive or that block with the next block of the message, and um, then encrypt that, and so forth. So that's, um, and then you throw away everything except the last block is the CBC residue, and that's you know just a commonly used function. It turns out it's easy to create a message that has a particular CBC residue. And um, so, you know, at the time, these blocks were 64 bits. So, um, how to create a message that has a particular residue? Uh, you want to have a message that has this as the residue, and you know what message you want. And the only thing you're constrained with is one of the blocks of the message, which is eight bytes, has to be garbage. Um, so, you know ahead of time what these things are going to be. Those are the plain text and message. You know what the residue is. What you do is you work backwards from here. You decrypt this. You exclusive were it with that block of the message and so forth. And then you work forward from here and that will constrain what that is. So, um, how do you forge a PEM message? Well, Alice sends to Bob an encrypted email using CBC residue as the integrity check. And Alice chooses some key to encrypt the message and to do the uh, CBC residue. And in the header of the message, she puts that secret key K encrypted with Bob's public key. And, the C and, and then she signs the residue of the message with her, um, with her key. So now, Bob has this piece of information, which is a 64-bit CV, you know, thing that can be used as a CBC residue, signed by Alice's key, and now he can send a message to anybody he wants, claiming to be Alice, as long as he makes sure that the CBC residue is that. But that requires doing some decryption, right? If you go back one slide, to go backwards, you have to do decryption, right? Uh, you can pick any key you want. No, but one one way is when originally was doing encryption. Yeah. Going in this direction, you're using the key to, to encrypt. Wait, Bob does not know how to decrypt, doesn't have the private, at least private key. It's not private key. This is um, yeah, secret key encryption. Yeah. Oh, these, are, these are symmetric keys. Right. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, he can, he can send a message to anybody, and as long as he constrains it to have the right um, CBC residue and sign it. So um, wouldn't it look suspicious to have this eight bytes of garbage in the message? Well, if you look at like email headers and stuff, there's all sorts of cyber crud in there. You could probably hide it in there. Or you could even hide it in the text. So I, I said, hi, Joe, I was fixing the roof this weekend and accidentally hit my thumb and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> back to my point. Give Bob a promotion and a big raise. <laughs> so. Um, why, if CBC residue isn't secure, how can it be secure for banking? And the reason is that it's a different property. Um, um, the banking requires a property that CBC residue does have, 
which is that if you don't know the secret, you can't verify or generate a checksum. So you can't create a message with the correct checksum. But message digests have the property that it's infeasible to create two messages with the same digest. So CBC residue is secure for banking, but not email. So it works for banks because banks trust everybody who holds the key. Yeah, that, well, there'd only be two parties to any particular key. Sure. Yeah. Um, OK, so new topic now is knowing the threats. So. Um, HTTP that you use on the web all the time is a stateless protocol, uh, meaning you just sort of send a message and you know get a response. That's the end of it. But that's not really what people want. They want the um, the feeling that they have this long-lived relationship with the website. And so, in order to create that, um, uh, you know, cookies were invented, where cookies are a message that the website sends to you and you send back. Um, so when they invented the concept of cookies, they um, were thinking, well, we better encrypt them. Because one way that you might use the um, cookie is that um, um, you've now sent your username and password. The website knows it's you. So um, you know, encrypt this thing saying that, yes, this is really Radia. Um, and so um, you can use SSL, and, and the cookies are encrypted. No problem. What they didn't realize was that the user could be a threat as well. They didn't really think of the user as a, um, you know, as an antagonist in this case. So, um, um, and there was no standard for how you use the cookies. Just send whatever you want. So, um, a typical use of a cookie back then was kind of the shopping cart. So, the um, message that would be put onto your computer by, um, you know, by the shopping site would be the list of items you were buying and the prices. And it was unencrypted. And there was this file on your machine. And so people realized that, ooh, I could buy a yacht for 79 cents. <laughs> Um, and there's lots of other misuses found in this incredibly wonderful paper, The Do's and Don'ts of um, Client Authentication on the Web. Basically, these students asked people, send me your cookies from all these sites, and they analyzed what it was doing. Um, OK, so new topic. Um, there's sort of different ways of um, having um, uh, you know, keys uh, distributed by trusted third parties. And I will explain the pros and cons of these various schemes. So there's CAs, um, which are like public key things. There's KDCs, which is when you base it on secret keys. And Kerberos is a KDC system. And bearer tokens. And they all work, but there are functionally different um, you know, properties that is important to understand. So just the fact that it works doesn't mean, you know, right. Um, so with secret keys, if you're using symmetric keys um, or secret keys, A and B have to share the same secret. And so you wouldn't want to, if you were doing this on the internet, you wouldn't want to have to configure a pair of keys between every two entities. That, that would be horrible. So instead, you have a magic box known as a KDC, or a key distribution center, that knows a secret for each possible user. And then that means everyone can talk to the KDC, but who cares? No one wants to talk to the KDC. Alice wants to talk to Bob. And so, but because the KDC knows a secret for Alice and for Bob, it can securely introduce them. So the way this is, would work is that the KDC knows a secret for each, um, each thing. Each thing only needs to know one secret. And then when Alice wants to talk to Bob, she tells that to the KDC. The KDC randomly chooses a new secret that it can send a message securely to Alice using the secret that it shares with Alice, saying, if you want to talk to Bob, use case of AB, and can securely send a message to Bob saying, if you want to talk to Alice, use case of AB. And now they share a secret. So, OK. In contrast, let's look at certificates with, with CAs, cert certification authorities, uh, using public keys. So the CA signs a certificate saying, I vouch that this number is Radius public key. 
So if everybody has a certificate and they know their own private key, know the CA's public key, then everything works straightforwardly. Alice sends her certificate to Bob. Bob verifies the CA's um, signature, now knows Alice's key, sends his certificate. Um, um, Alice verifies the signature, knows Bob's key, and now they can do mutual authentication, encryption, all, all this wonderful stuff. So um, the way it ought to work, most systems deployed don't do it this wonderful way, but um, um, the CA should not have to be on the network. You know, like when you get hired at the company and they give you your badge, they drag out the CA and create a certificate for you. Um, um, you know, it should write it on, on a floppy disk or something that you carry and, and post on, on the network. Um, and in order to do quick revocation, you know, like if you fire Fred, um, you need to have something online to, uh, that somebody can check to see who's been fired lately or uh, can check to see which ones are valid or whatever. Um, so there'll be something online, but the revocation server will not be nearly as um, security sensitive as actually having the CA online. So um, assuming that kind of um, model of how the public key step is uh, built, the KDC solution will be less secure. It has to be online, which means it's an attractive target. It's a complicated system, so it's likely to have bugs. It has to be replicated for performance and availability. Physical access to any one of them is, is a problem. Um, and it has this highly sensitive database of all user secrets. Um, cause the KDC is going to be a big performance sensitive thing, whereas the CA is just a glorified calculator. Um, and it's okay if it's down for a few hours and has to be fixed. Um, performance, although public key, the math is slower, the fact that you have to talk to extra things will dwarf any of that. Um, and privacy, the KDC knows everything that you talk to. So review, KDC is an availability issue, a performance issue, a security issue, and a privacy issue. Um, now you can do worse. <laughs> I'll talk about bearer tokens, which is you know, this, this thing that's um, you know, been done even more recently. Um, so the concept of a bearer token is you have this um, a server on the web, um, you know, called an, an authentication service of some kind. And Alice says, I want to talk to Bob. Uh, to Bob. And she can use any sort of authentication um, that, you know, is supported by the authentication service. She can use public keys, she can use a username and password or whatever. Once the authentication service believes that she's Alice, the authentication service sends a message signed, uh, it signs a message saying, um, uh, Bob, this is Alice. And then Alice can take this message and send it to Bob, and Bob now knows that this must be Alice, that somebody um, verified that this was Alice. So what's wrong with this? It's worse than a KDC. It has all the same problems of availability because the authentication service has to be there, performance because you're talking to extra things, um, security if you broke into that thing, everybody's impersonated everywhere, and privacy. It knows everybody that's talking to everybody else. But it's worse than the KDC thing because if Alice is tricked into talking to somebody that isn't really Bob, they now have this message claiming that they're Bob and they can impersonate Alice um, at the real Bob. So um, if she accidentally is talking to a fake Bob, Bob can now impersonate Alice there. So why are people doing this? Well, they sort of very cleverly took the existing implementations of browsers, uh, uh, I don't know how long they've been working on this, you know, probably 10 years or something, and said, we can do all these, you know, with HTTP redirects and cookies and all this fancy stuff. We can have this system that can work with existing browsers. And that's really cool that you can do that if you have to get something out the door in three months. But given how browsers change all the time and you have to have plugins, 
I really wish the world would come up with something that actually worked, um, you know, kind of more along the lines of real public key stuff. Um, now, some big companies see this privacy issue as a feature because they can audit everyone that talks to everybody else. But <laughs> you, can do all, you can do all the auditing that you want without giving up all the other um, uh, problems. Just because you can get it this way doesn't mean you couldn't get it um, um, another way. So, summary number two. Um, you need to know what properties you need when you're designing a system. You need to know where the threats are. Um, and I talked about the functional difference between these things. <coughs> okay, people seem to be doing okay. Okay, so a new topic is evolution versus intelligent design. <laughs> and it's not what you think it is. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about an actual deployed system. Um, it was one of the first deployed public key systems. A user, users had public keys, which was really cool. The certificates for each user was posted in a directory. And Alice, Alice's private key was stored on her own machine, encrypted with her password. So the way you used it was you walked into work, you went to your machine, you typed your password, which unlocked your machine and decrypted your private key. And now you could use uh, uh, your private key to authenticate to any site that you wanted. So on her machine was her private key encrypted with some sort of hash of her password X. Um, okay, so that was fine. The next step in the evolution was that they realized sometimes Alice wanted to authenticate to machines that weren't capable of using public keys. They, they had to use username and password. So um, um, Alice had another password, let's call that W for the web password, and for those um, sites, um, um, in order, like if Alice logs into this site, it doesn't know her password, but in the directory is um, stored a hash of her password so that when Alice says she's Alice, it can go look up the hash of the password so that it can verify her using her password. So, um, yeah, you could, you know, if Alice doesn't choose a good password, there's a dictionary attack. I'm not worried about that now. So, um, you know, there's two reasonable systems. The public key thing, where she unlocks her, um, 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 her uh, <laughs> client machine using that password and then a different password for authenticating to servers. But then users wanted to be able to log in from other machines other than their own. So they posted their private key encrypted with a hash of X on the directory, public world readable. And so now you have in the directory world readable, Alice's private key encrypted with a hash of X and a hash of her web password are both there. So what's the problem with this? Um, no particular problem unless users choose the same password for both purposes. Um, because, um, you know, who would do that? Just like pretty much every user. <laughs> so, um, you know, what you have there is your private key encrypted with that and this in the same place. If they're the same password, then you can easily get everybody's private key. And so it was like every little step was logical but these things kind of interrelated in, in bad ways. Okay, next topic is trust models for PKI. Um, so what's PKI? It stands for Public Key Infrastructure. It's who is the CA, <laughs> you know, how, um, and I will talk about various models and I'll give them cute names, because um, the world worries about what a certificate looks like and, and but they don't really think about this part. And so, um, um, yeah. So I'll talk about all these various models. Um, and yeah, I'll talk about each one. So the first model I call monopoly. You find one organization that's universally trusted by, by all countries, all companies. Um, you embed their public key in absolutely everything. Everyone has to get certificates from them. This is nice and simple to implement and deploy, but what's wrong with it? 
well, monopoly pricing. <laughs> if this one organization um, is clever, they'll give this away like crack, and um, the more widely deployed it is, the more expensive it is for the world to take out their public key and, and put in a different public key. Um, and that one organization can impersonate everybody. So you have to find one employee at that organization that is um, confused or can be bribed or threatened or whatever. Okay, so the next model is kind of what's in browsers, which I call an oligarchy, which is that your browser comes configured with a hundred or so public keys and um, your browser will accept certificates signed by any of those. And so this does eliminate the monopoly pricing problem, but um, it's less secure because it's much easier to find an employee, a weak employee in one of a hundred organizations than it is in um, only one. Okay, so the next concept that we're going to get to the model I'm going to recommend is chains of certificates. So um, instead of forcing Bob to get a certificate signed by one of the CAs that Alice trusts, instead he can present a a chain of certificates where Alice is configured to trust X1 and he gets a certificate saying X1 says this is X2's key, X2 says this is X's three's key, and X3 says this is Bob's key. So this will give us a bit of flexibility. So the next model I'm going to talk about I call anarchy, where um, this was sort of designed by the PGP people that uh, you know didn't like anyone telling them who they should trust. So. Um, um, if you meet somebody and they seem trustworthy, you can configure their public key into your machine. And every time you have a gathering of nerds, like a standards meeting, you have a PGP key signing party with some sort of ritual where you say who you are and what your key is and people vouch for you and whatever. And um, so you can create certificates and then there are these public databases of certificates that you can donate your certificates to and you can also read what's in there in order to search. So the idea is if Alice wants to find Bob's key, if it's not configured in her machine, she tries to piece together a chain from one of the keys in her machine through these public databases until she finds one um, that leads, a, a, a link that leads to um, Bob's name. So what's the problem with this? Well, it's not going to scale. You know, it's the kind of thing that people deploy in a small community of all trustworthy people and say, ta-da, it works. But just by sheer size, it's going to fall apart. It, with, you know, a billion users on the internet, each one on the average signing 10 certificates, just the database is going to be too hard to search through. But <clears throat> the other thing is once people start polluting it, with bad certificates, either because they just don't check very carefully, or you know, th these are just ordinary users, they're not well trained, or maliciously they do it, um, then just because by some miracle you find a chain that leads to somebody's name doesn't mean that's really their key. So now I'll talk about how I think it should work. So the first concept is that you shouldn't think of a CA as trusted or not trusted. Instead, a CA should be trusted for only certain things. And the only model that I've seen, the only policy that I've seen that makes any sense is that the name by which I know you implies who I trust to certify your key. So if you know me as RadiaPerlmanEMC.com, you would trust some CA associated with EMC to sign that key. If you know me as you know, roadrunner.socialnetworksite.com. You would trust them to certify the key associated with that. And whether these are the same carbon-based life form is, is irrelevant. So in order to do this, we need a hierarchical namespace. And ha ha, we have it, <laughs> DNS. Um, so each node in the namespace is going to be represented. You may want to say what is DNS. What? You may want to explain what is DNS. Oh, DNS is just kind of the names that we use on the internet, like, um, you know, labs.emc.com. Um, so, um, yeah, each node in the namespace is going to be represented by a CA. So, the first model that people think of when I say that is they think that you're configured with the root key 
and every like a.com will certify ma.a.com and nj.a.com and this thing will certify its children so um, um, that's what they think of but if you do that um, where everyone's configured with the root key it's easy to find a path to everyone's name but you still have a monopoly at the root and the root can impersonate everybody so now we're getting to the model that I um, really like. It's been around for like 25 years and nobody gets it. So, um, you know, it's very frustrating to me because like they did DNSSEC, which was kind of um, adding public keys into DNS. And um, my co-author actually was involved in that committee and he added what's, uh, well, I'll, up certificates and cross certificates. He had that added into the standard and then he sort of stopped going to the meetings and s people said, what are these here for? And they took them out. So DNS is a top-down model. But I'll explain this other model and why it's so frustrating that the world doesn't do it this way. So each ARC in the namespace not only has the parent certify the child, but the child certify the parent. Um, and if you do that, you don't have to be configured with the root key. You can start anywhere you want, like for instance with your own key, and you go up as far as you need to to get to a common ancestor and then go down. Um, and so, um, yeah. And then another concept you need is a cross certificate where any, there's sort of two reasons for it. Um, uh, one is that you don't have to wait for the whole PKI for the whole world to get connected. You can have this organization, that organization, put them together. And also you can bypass parts of the hierarchy if you don't trust certain CAs there. So a cross-link um, is where any node can certify any other node. Um, so here you kind of go up as far as necessary to either get to a common ancestor and go down or get to a cross-link and then go down. Um, and if you don't trust the root, you can create a cross-link so you'll bypass it. Now the first thing that people think is I've just created the anarchy model, but no. The reason it's not the anarchy model is you don't explore a cross-link to see where else it leads. You only go to a cross-link if it gets you to an ancestor of the, name, uh, of the target name. So with this model, um, with this model, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, security, that's presumably the most security sensitive stuff, which is authentication between resources in your own namespace. Will, the chains of trust will never leave your namespace. The, it, security is completely in your own hands. There's no single compromise key that requires massive reconfiguration. If you did have a nice tree for the whole world, and somebody decided, oh, that, that root has lost its private key or whatever, it doesn't affect, it, it, even though you might think it would affect a lot of people, it doesn't affect me as a user. I don't have to change my key. I don't have to get a new certificate. I don't have to do anything different. Just somebody way high up in the hierarchy has to do the fancy revocation and new certificates and whatever magic. It doesn't affect me, things will just work. The only time it affects me is when the CA in my building wants to change its key. And there's few enough people that IT can, the IT department can individually hunt us each down and handhold us through whatever magic needs to happen. Um, it's also easy to compute paths. Um, and the trust policy is very natural and makes sense. Um, and malicious <laughs> CAs can be bypassed so that damage is contained. So, um, summary number three, secure things can evolve into insecure things. Um, and crypto algorithms and certificate formats leave out the hard decisions of trust models, which people, you know, they say, here's the certificate format, build whatever you want with it. But, it, it, you know, it takes some thought and it's this bottom-up thing. It seems so obvious to me, but yet the world is, continues to not build things that, that use that. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, another topic is when you use a key for two different things. You might not realize how they relate. So here's an authentication protocol 
where Alice knows her private key. Bob knows Alice's public key. She claims to be Alice. He sends her a challenge, and she operates on it with her private key, meaning she's either decrypting or signing something. So the problem is, how does Alice know that's a random number and not the message digest of a message that says, I owe Bob a billion dollars? Or the header of an email message that has the secret key encrypted with Bob's key, yes? Or worse, Bob's public key. Yes, well, n uh, Bob's public key. Because then he can decrypt it and get her private key. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that one, but yeah, okay. But you know, at any rate, y y you, can, you can get into trouble here. Um, so, here's another example where Alice and Bob share a secret key, K. Alice says, I'm Alice. Bob gives her a challenge. She sends back the challenge encrypted with their secret. Then Bob sends a challenge, and Alice sends back um, that challenge encrypted with their secret. There's nothing wrong with this, except that if you have any soul as a protocol designer, you realize you could do it in fewer messages. So let's do it in fewer messages. We can do it in three. Alice says, I'm Alice. Here's my challenge. Bob encrypts that challenge, sends her his challenge, and then Alice sends that challenge. What's the problem with this? Well, an attack that we call the reflection attack. Trudy, who's attempting to impersonate Alice, says, I'm Alice, here's my challenge. Bob sends the answer to that challenge, sends another challenge. Now Trudy's stuck because she doesn't know how to encrypt R1. But she could create a second connection saying, I'm Alice, my challenge is R1. <laughs> Bob gives her the answer, and now she can finish the first one. And computers don't kind of think about these things, like why is Alice trying to do two connections, or I remember that challenge. You know, right, so this is the kind of bug that you're likely to have. OK, so a new topic, which um, this one's kind of deep. And so how is your attention span? Uh, should I, t I have one more deep thing, and then I have like fun stuff at the end. So I'm wondering whether I should skip the, um, uh, well, I'll see what your face is like. What? Fun stuff will reward after. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Um, all right, so one of the um, areas that I've always been interested in is resilience despite malfunctioning participants. So, the concept of a failure, a lot of people, when they design a system, they say, okay, we're going to have 10 active components so that if nine of them goes down, the thing will still work. But they don't, what I see often in these systems is 10 single points of failure. Because um, if they fail, stop. If they just work perfectly and halt, that's great. But if instead they um, start doing bad things and, t you know, like if it's a distributed database and start telling everyone also change the database this way, then, um, you know, ev every one of them can screw things up. So the term Byzantine failure, uh, which is where something continues working but not doing the right stuff, came from a famous computer science problem, uh, a paper known as the Byzantine Generals problem. And there's lots of papers about how hard it is to do the particular problem cited there, which was to get a bunch of processors to agree on the value of a bit. Um, so what causes these things? Well, malware or hardware failures, misconfiguration, bugs. It doesn't have to be malicious. Um, but the main point is that a participant is not operating the way you'd expect it to. So all sorts of things can be subverted with a small number of malicious participants. This is one of the favorite papers that I've read recently. Uh, you, um, it's called How a Lone Hacker Shredded the Myth of Crowdsourcing, where um, somebody was trying to solve one of these puzzles that had like tens of thousands of participants all sort of doing their bit. And turned out one guy, by moving puzzle pieces around, and, uh, and then they noticed one guy was being malicious. They tried to um, filter out his IP address, who just came in from multiple IP address, and the one guy was able to completely foil the 10,000 people from making any progress. It's just an excellent paper. Um, <laughs> and then there's um, things that can't possibly work, but do, like Wikipedia, 
there's no excuse for it being so good. Um, you know, it should just be full of rants about, you know, Obamacare or, you know, who knows what. Um, but if you're searching for something, that tends to be the best source of concise, well-written articles. I don't, it, and anyone can edit it. It's just astonishing. And then eBay, like you want shoes. So you search for, you know, shoes, you find it in, with some merchant you never heard of before, in some country you never heard of before, you send them money and shoes appear. You know, this is really just a miracle. <laughs> um, but, yeah? It's just a matter of this trust model you mentioned before, right? The, the systems work because they have the right trust model and the right incentives built into them. So it's not really completely magic. Uh, right, right. There, the, he was saying that um, there's trust and incentives to make it work. Um, that's a subtle thing. If you ask me to design the concept of Wikipedia with the right trust and incentives, given that no one's being paid for anything, and make it work, I don't know how Wikipedia works, so I'm willing to declare it a miracle. <laughs> Um, and eBay, you know, I've never bought anything terribly expensive there, but I'm always incredibly surprised when I buy something and it appears on my doorstep. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, if I had infinite time, which I uh, would don't... You buy, would you buy a car on eBay? No, I wouldn't. I've never done anything really expensive. I, I don't even trust buying a car from, like, a private person that I can see, because, you know, whatever. But yes? People do buy like cars and boats and houses and other like very expensive things. Yeah, it works. And the, the right. shows up in your <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but Wikipedia works so well because it is so easy to break it. There's no point in breaking it. You just look like an no. idiot if you break it. <laughs> right, so his theory is it works because it, you know, um, it's kind of the honor system. Yes, people did break mm -hmm. it to begin with, but then it all went. No, no, it's right. not so easy to break. It used to be okay. many, many years yeah. ago, but now it is, there's a lot of. Uh, well, they, they put in. They put in more. Actually, I, mean, I know of a very charming um, mistake in Wikipedia. Um, I know somebody whose girlfriend is from some country that I never heard of. Let, let's call it Elbonia or whatever, um, <laughs> and. Um, so he edits Wikipedia. So on the the Wikipedia page about this country, you know, Albonia, uh, which it, it's actually a real. His girlfriend is from a real country, but I don't want to say the country anyway, even if I could remember it. Um, so it it says, you know, Albonia is a country that big with this population, and they export, you know, potatoes or you know whatever. And then it says famous people who came from Melbonia and it has some names that no one ever heard of. He added his girlfriend's name into the list <laughs> and no one's noticed that. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, um, there are several different examples, you know, that I could give about how to design things to um, be resilient despite malicious participants. So PKI I talked about already with, with a model that can, um, you know, M uh, contain the damage. My thesis was how to build a network that is resilient even if some of the switches are malicious, where a malicious switch can lie in the distributed algorithm that d decides what the paths are, can flood the network with garbage, can forward packets off in random directions, can do everything perfectly, but when they see packets from you, they throw it away. And um, it was actually quite simple. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was simple enough that I was kind of nervous they wouldn't give me a PhD for it. But you know, they had agreed <laughs> when I suggested the problem. Oh, it's hard, it's important. Um, so uh, yeah, they kind of had to. Um, and then I was um, going to talk about this system that I designed recently that um, allows you to reliably hold on to data um, in a storage system, but give it expiration dates so when it expires, it's absolutely gone. Um, and the reason that it's very interesting is that there's kind of two ways of doing it. One which is not resilient. So let's see how bad this is. Um, uh, and, and there's a paper about it. You know what? I think I'm going to skip this one. But this is the deep one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's okay. <laughs> um, all right. So now I'm going to get to the uh, fun stuff. 
I call it stupid human interfaces, and please do not misparse it. I do not mean stupid humans. I mean stupid interfaces. <laughs> so, um, um, people just design these things badly. So, um, on one machine I had, um, the machine would blank, uh, it, the screen would go blank just to save power after just a couple of seconds. Um, or if it was like a minute, it would, um, um, I'd have to retype my password because it would lock the screen. And if it was like five minutes, I'd have to type my username and then my password. But it was a little annoying how long it took for the screen to wake up. So I got trained that almost always I had to type my password. So when I saw the blank screen, I would type my password. So <laughs> the problem was I would, um, um, if I was in the screen save mode, which is where it's just, um, you know, sleeping, but anything I type will continue. I often sent email to people where, you know, I got a phone call or something where in the middle of the email was this weird string, which was my password. And I kind of touch type, so I sort of don't notice it. Um, and one time I was giving a lecture where I kind of spent too much time on one slide, and so it actually logged me out. So I typed my password, and in front of everybody on the big projector, it said, welcome, fiddlesticks49, or whatever my password was, <laughs> instead of my username, yeah. Um, another thing is mistraining users. So I was at a company where every month we used to get a message saying, um, you know, virus awareness in this, you know, whatever. Don't open any attachments ever, even if your mother sent it to you. And every few days we would get a message from some unknown email address, because it was a contractor, saying, we're doing a survey on the cafeteria food. Click on the attachment and keep saying OK until the survey appears. And so um, I tried to complain. And they said, but that's not insecure. These surveys are created with survey tool. And there's no bugs in that. And I really wish I'd have had the courage to create my own survey saying, you know, um, a virus awareness survey and keep, with the exact same instructions, keep hitting OK until the survey appears. And then, you know, the questions would be, I am aware I just opened an attachment, yes or no. I did it anyway because I looked at the JavaScript and I verified it was OK, or, you know, I don't care about security or, or whatever. Um, also, we're constantly getting pop-ups like Outlook, um, constantly, and not with anything that you did. Some server went down, comes up. So it's completely asynchronous. You get this pop-up screen at which you need to type your username and password. Any application could um, post this sort of thing to train you to type your username and password. Abetting social engineering criminals. So there are these disease-infested vermin that call people up and say, hi, I'm from Microsoft. Your machine is broken, and let us help you. And no offense to disease-infested, you know, vermin, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, these people are really horrible. And, and they call, like, all the time. But I was actually curious one time to see where this would lead. Um, so, um, they said, we'll prove to you that your machine is infected. So, what they do is, it turns out on your PC, there's some bizarro thing called Event Logger. Never. <laughs> well, I've never used it. I've worked in IT. So. Oh, okay. So, I've, I've never, I have thought my, my life was complete before I ever knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you open it, there's all these errors and warnings that get logged that no human needs to worry about. But boy, if somebody points that out to you, they can terrify you. Your machine is clearly broken. Look at all these errors and warnings. Um, so, you know, even though in theory there's nothing insecure about this, from a social engineering thing, it's really very bad. Um, it's like so illegible, big problem. 
What? It's also, the warnings are also illegible. Right, the right, yeah, I mean, who knows what these things but are. But you have fun with these guys, like, you, know, <laughs> yes. you, you just keep dragging them on and on and on, and they, they pay, get paid by the hour, so just drag them on and on. So right, right. Yes, yeah, so after I went through all of this, um, I, um, you know, he said, okay, well, I'll, you know, uh, do this thing to let me have access to your machine, and I said, oh, look at the time, I have to pick up my kids from daycare, and, um, um, he said, no, no, this is important. I said, no, no, I, I can deal with that later. I have to go pick up my, he said, this is more important. I said, more important than picking up my kids from daycare. <laughs> I had to really hang up on him <laughs> because he was so close to yes. being able to destroy my machine. Um, so yeah, it's common to have to trade off usability versus security. So you would expect a graph like this, like the more secure it is, the less usable and so forth. But this is where the industry is today. <laughs> so user authentication. Every site has different rules for usernames and passwords. Um, some it has to be at least n characters, and another is no more than whatever. Um, so even, you know, it's just no way that people can cope with this. There was this excellent thing I saw on the internet that unfortunately I can't attribute because it's, you know, so I'll say anonymous. Sorry, but your password must contain an uppercase letter, a number, a haiku, a gang sign, a hieroglyph, and the blood of a virgin. <laughs> And um, recently I had to set a password and got the message, your password does not meet our length, complexity, or history rules without telling me what the rules were. <laughs> and actually, even if I forget my password, there ought to be a way of asking it, what are your criteria for passwords? So I would be able to remember what, and they won't tell you, yes? The theory is that a lot of these security people were trained by Kafka himself. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then security questions. Who comes up with these questions? So this is actually a set that I had once. Father's middle name. Nope, father didn't have a middle name. Second grade teacher's name. I couldn't remember my second grade teacher's name when I was in second grade. <laughs> Veterinarian's name. I don't have a pet. Favorite sports team. What's a sport? Um, <laughs> my middle name. Well, luckily I do have a middle name. It's Joy. I typed it in J-O-Y and it said, not enough letters. <laughs> and then there's annoying rules that add nothing to security, like you must change your password at least every n days. Um, or if you forget your password and then you go through something to prove it's really you, it won't let you reset your password to the one that would have been perfectly secure to continue using if you hadn't momentarily forgotten it. And these sorts of rules actually lower security. So I asked a friend in IT, why do you do these things? You know, um, it doesn't add to security. Do you enjoy torturing users? And he said, of course we do. That's the best part of the job. <laughs> but that's not why we do it. Um, we do it because um, there are these best practices things that are written up. And if you follow all of the rules and the best practices, you have um, more of a defense than if, if you got broken into and you say, we did even better stuff than that, um, it, you know, people won't understand that. So user authentication, I do not want to hear, we need better user training. Um, um, or people shouldn't click on suspicious links. What a weird <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Um, and then you know, making things convenient. Usually, like browsers remembering passwords is great, except that then when your machine dies or whatever, you can't remember anything at that point. So this is a quote from my security book that um, I'm particularly fond of. I, I, I wrote this quote. Um, but I would love it if everybody sort of really assimilated it into their subconscious, because I think it's very important. Humans are incapable of securely storing high-quality cryptographic keys, and they have unacceptable speed and accuracy when performing cryptographic operations. 
They're also large, expensive to maintain, difficult to manage, and they pollute the environment. It's astonishing that these devices continue to be manufactured and deployed, but they are sufficiently pervasive that we must design our protocols around their limitations. <laughs> so basically, design for humans, don't expect humans to change for you. <laughs> right, thank you. So so that's the talk. Thank you. And certainly plenty of time for questions if anybody want yes. So this is a group on, on computability. And of course one of the many results in computability going back to uh, Turing was that there are unsolvable or undecidable problems. But I've come to the conclusion that these are not our problem, our real problem with information technology. Security seems to be an unsolvable problem. You know, we've been doing research in security now for decades. Smart people like you write books. It makes no difference. Every week you read another, you know, voting, what was the last thing? You know, voting uh, records were broken, insurance company. I mean, I'm not talking about small mom and pop that don't have, they don't quite know how to do it. Right? Big organization with lots of resources, lots of best practices, and now they're talking about everything connected to the internet, right? I mean, to me, this is a nightmare, right? When we have a, a pencil and paper, things were secure. <laughs> right. And we seem to have lost this innocence, and with all the research, all the money that goes into this, things are only getting worse. Yes. <laughs> so I, I wish I had like one answer. If only we did X, Y, and Z, the world would be great. But um, yeah, the, um, to some extent it's just frustration because people are doing silly things in the systems. Um, and you know, there's, um, it, you're right. Uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, things are just too complicated. They're doing evolution instead of create um, intelligent design, you know, where they're saying, well, we take existing browsers and if we do these little hooks, we can do little things to, um, but also these general purpose machines um, that you download apps into and stuff, rather than designing a nice simple system that just does what you want to do, um, you know, it's like uh, Word should just, take um, um, data and make a picture on my screen. It shouldn't be dangerous, but um, you know, just in case somebody wants to open up a Word document that goes and queries my bank to get my bank information and fills this all out, there are all these features there. I never want those features. So you know, there's kind of too much fancy, cute stuff that people don't really need. Um, but yeah, at least kind of letting people know that, yeah, that but, there's a problem. Yeah. But was the internet born in, born in sin in some sense? Because there was no security when the internet was designed. And now we're trying to later on come and it seems hopeless. You know, when you have, when underlying infrastructure has no notion of security, right. it was almost a philosophy to get infrastructure on which application will come later. And now we, we just seem to, we've been trying to do it now for 20 years and it's a colossal failure. Right, but I'm not sure that you could do all that much better if you said throw away everything and design again from, from scratch. I mean, there's, there's certain problems that you want to authenticate people. People are going to forget things and, um, you know, write things down and, um, you know, biometrics are sort of nice for opening your smartphone but not for uh, saying across a network, I'm radia because my fingerprint looks like that because these things are not going to be secret. So yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of open-ended. But the good news is you guys are, a lot of you are from universities. You don't want the world to be nice and clean. You want it to be full of messy stuff so you can find things to write papers about. <laughs> <laughs> And today I have so many logs, so that you know somebody will go to my neighbor and not to me to break into. That's the one that you had lost. You had a phone though. <laughs> yeah, when my son was about six weeks old, it was a um, warm winter day, and so um, I had him in the car seat in the back, and so I got out of the driver's seat, and I realized, you know, it's warm enough. I don't need my coat, so. Without thinking, I put my car key in my pocket of my coat, 
put my coat on the driver's seat, locked the front door, and realized, oh my gosh, my baby is locked in the car. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, you know, it gets like 900 degrees within 35 seconds or whatever, you know, a, a mother is not terribly rational at this point. So I'm, I'm sitting there being like all upset, and this 12-year-old kid comes by and says, what's the matter, lady? And I said, my baby, oh, whatever. And he said, oh, don't worry. So he knocks on the nearest door, asks for a coat hanger, <laughs> And he's into my car in just a few seconds. <laughs> so I figured if any nearby 12-year-old kid can get into my car, why am I locking it? <laughs> yeah, it's um, difficult. I don't know if yeah. you, you remember the SAIL, the stands for the yeah, island yeah, yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. There are no passwords. Gentlemen don't look at each yeah. other person's files. Yeah. Yes, as a matter of fact, I was there at that time um, with the MIT AI lab, and when they started saying we should have passwords, boy, were people angry. It's like, well, what if he has a bug in his code and I need to, yeah. But you, you had a question. When they got insane, there was one password. Yeah, can we do the leak container? I see. Because of the H21. Yeah. That was the only password we needed. To connect from Chrome, you didn't give you a password for 300,000 modem. But then what happened was that Gary Miller got a password and told the total one. Right. So you had a question? Yeah. The truth is that when it comes to investigating what does locking the car actually help, it turns out that it's a huge help because um, people will try the car door and if it's locked, they'll look for one that isn't. Right. So it helps you, but it's so it's really only helping against the, the opportunistic criminals. Right. And a lot of computer security, I reckon, is like that too. If you find you know, a site that isn't secured, oh, I'll go trash it. But if it is secured, I can't be bothered. Right. If Though if they're going to break into my car to look to steal the stereo, I'd rather they didn't break the window too. So yeah, that's another reason to leave it unlocked, I guess. But yeah, it's, you have to trade off these things. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, a couple of quick questions. KDC is also a monopoly, right? Just like CO. Oh, KDC has exactly the same trust models that are possible to build with it. So you can do it as a monopoly. Or you could do a top-down model or an anarchy model. All the same models would still work, where you go to one uh, KDC and ask it to introduce you to another KDC, and you'd have to walk along the path. But you could build the top-down, bottom-up, um, oligarchy, any of those models you could build with KDCs. Okay. Uh, and in this bottom-up model that you suggested, how do you actually go about um, establishing those cross-links cross -links between different namespaces? Right. Well, you'd have to call people on the phone and say, what is your public key? Or, you know, like try it once, like by going up through the hierarchy, and if that seems to work, then you might lock it down. Then, um, you know, if, if you're doing, you have like two labs in different organizations doing some highly secret thing, you're likely to talk on the phone and be able to directly have some like, yeah. Oh, well then, at the same thing as if there wasn't a route, you just can't get there, or um, you go through the less secure thing anyway. It sort of depends on what you're doing, whether you're willing to uh, trust this path. So you have to configure your trust model. Yeah, or you have to configure things so that you're happy with the trust, and maybe as backup you can use other paths that you're not as happy with um, if you're desperate. There were a bunch of hands, yes? So you were skeptical of the power of uh, proofs to establish security. No, I'm but saying they're not completely... No, I, no, yeah, I agree with right. you. The proofs yeah. can be abused, and you always question what is the, you know, what exactly are you proving? What is correctness? If you just say it's correct, it's a meaningless step. What is correct with respect to, you know, what kind right. of, uh, what, what uh, security models are you using, what assumption are you using? But on the other hand, without proofs, it seemed to me even worse, right? To see something looks good until you, you know, somebody looks at it and come up with a, something you, some scenario you did not consider. Right. So at least so I think of a proof as a systematic way of trying to establish security. 
And the abuse is that uh, we're not being careful about writing exactly what are the assumptions. I mean, I think if, you, if, if there is abuse, there is people are not very precise about assumptions. Right, but also if the proof is so complicated that you can't understand it, then it's like, well, okay, there's a proof there, but I, I don't really believe it unless I can really understand it. Because people have gotten PhDs for proofs that not only is the proof wrong, but the theorem they were proving was incorrect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I actually think that we have two different problems here. One problem is that oh, too, all too often proofs are so complicated that they are not actually verified sufficiently. This is one problem, and it's definitely this problem does exist. The other problem, which I think is more severe, is that people often don't read carefully enough or don't write carefully enough what is the theorem. What are they actually proving? Right. Uh, what is the model, etc., etc. Now, uh, proof, even if the proof is completely correct, if you misinterpret, and, and let's say you know, it, it is correct, right? But if the reader is not actually understanding, not the proof, but the theorem, the model, you know, what the proof is actually, what the theorem is saying, then you can you know, get into a very bad shape. Right, or the theory, uh, you might be proving some small part of the system without thinking about its interactions with other things. Yes? This is kind of a naive outsider's question, but here's kind of how I heard the talk go down. So your slogan was, you know, uh, evolution versus intelligent design, and it was an anguished call for intelligent design rather than the evolution. But it's going to be evolution, and the problem with the evolution, again, the way I was hearing it is, uh, people's modifications in the evolving system uh, interact with one another. Yep. And there's no way to sort of cross-check because if there's any of them, then there's two to the end cross-checks you have to do, and nobody's going to do that. You notice some of them, um, and you're horrified, but then there'll be the other ones that nobody happened to notice. Yep. Uh, do people give thoughts to way you could constrain the evolutionary process? So rules you could uh, introduce I don't know for penalizing actors when they, you know, people realize they did the horrifying thing, or for preemptive cross checks. For I mean, it, it, do people discuss that at all? Well, there, yeah, there's all sorts of things people are doing, like uh, um, <coughs> you know, trying to prove that programs are correct by feeding it lots of random inputs and seeing if they can make it crash and so forth. There's you know, whole sciences there, which is not really my specialty. Nothing is foolproof. Um, you know, I think having simpler systems would be a start. Um, having systems of authentication that, um, you know, I as a cranky person <laughs> would be willing to put up with would be nice. A million different usernames and passwords is, is not something I'm willing to put up with. Um, you know, so I I have in mind ways that I think things could be improved, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why the world doesn't do things nicely. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So about the cost links, so your response was that you create the cost links, you just call them on the phone and then you establish a secret. So there's two questions about it. First, you probably got the phone number from the internet. <laughs> Good point. And, and, and another is that, well, you're trusting the phone company. So it's a monopoly, and, and it, you, you trust them that when you dial the number, you get to the right place, but why? Uh, or, or, or alternatively, why can't you take the phone company model and implement it for the internet, and then you put in the right number, and then you get to the right place? Yeah, there used to be things called phone books. And you'd find people's, uh, uh, right, um, uh, phone numbers in that. Now, I don't really know how people get people's phone numbers, but I don't think it's through any sort of secure means. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you already had attacks on the phone books. They're taking a malicious phone number, and instead of the actual number, they're a little bit inside the phone book. Any attack that works on the NS phone works on the phone book. Right. And so, in theory, instead of the telephone number, because you pointed out maybe the phone number isn't correct, you could actually get on an airplane and fly to the place. But again, people have impersonated FBI offices and, and whatever, at least they do in movies. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, yeah. Yes? So, lament the security state situation in the internet, but I guess the question is what's the standard that 
you're having in mind that we, we should aim for. I mean, if you think of this, the computational mathematical context, you are looking for, for a perfect solution. But if you think of this as a human situation, well, look around you. We're in the Middle East here, right? I mean, most human situations are much less uh, secure in, in very dire uh, ways. So if, if that's the uh, standard, maybe this, uh, the Internet is not so bad after all. Right. So why should the Internet be any more secure than just, you know, flying on an airplane where, um, or, you know, there's... Or living in somewhere in many places in the world where it's very dangerous to get out of there. Right, and from not from even... Flying an airplane actually is incredibly safe. safe. If you look right. at the accident rate, it's, it's incredibly low. Right, can so... Can uh, quantify our, our security and say, is it, is it, is it really bad or is it just a perception? Right. Yeah. So the the press uh, plays up some fears and sort of ignores others. You know, like probably driving to the airport, you're in more danger than 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 flying. Um, yeah, it, it's it's all kind of very difficult, and you'll never have a hundred percent security. So like all of the crypto in the world is not going <clears> to <throat> help you from a deranged employee, you know, going berserk or whatever. So I, I have no answers for this. I, you know, the point of this talk was really to raise the questions and um, um, and let you see what a fertile ground there is for for research. Because <laughs> yes, you can see that people somehow behave differently on the internet than they behave in real life. For example, you can take your car, drive it to the middle of the highway, turn it around, get out, and move away, and create a huge jam and put every day. And but people somehow don't do that. You haven't seen this being done. Uh, and to, you know, and to sabotage somehow the network, people are willing to do. And the reason is probably is because they're sitting somewhere, they think that nobody can see them, probably they've been probably slow, even though it's not even good nowadays, and so they do it. And moreover, they, they don't even, you know, they download programs they don't understand and use them because they somehow manage to uh, get things worse to support. So, so, so you know, we have kids downloading programs that they don't understand, but they can attack all sorts of sites and, and get away. No, no, no. Of course, they do all sorts of tricks, and kids do, but uh, somehow people in real life behave reasonably well, and eventually they behave worse. And, and that requires some psychological explanation, but I'm not an expert. Okay. Thank you.